Hi, my name is Paul Birch and I'm the author of, of this book entitled The Life and Times of His Lord and Ladyship. And it also has a little byline which says it's all about chips. So I'm just going to read the first chapter which is reasonably brief. Chapter 1 In the Beginning His Lordship and Her Ladyship were VIPs, very important people. They also had a teenage son. Now Timothy was a good lad, except when it was meal time. Then he had a problem. Timothy wouldn't eat, wouldn't eat, couldn't eat, unless he had chips. So he had chips with everything, every day. And every day his mother would tell him, one day you'll turn into a chip. And that's exactly what happened. Poor Timothy cried her ladyship and blew her nose. Poor show, I'd say, said his lordship, and blew his top. What to do, what to do? The day of the village fate as well. What will we do? What will we do? cried her ladyship over and over again. Only one thing for it, said his lordship. We'll have to turn to chips too, and fast. But how, how, said her ladyship, who by this time was quite distraught. Steady old thing, said his lordship. Stiff up a living all that. Suddenly his lordship had an idea. Of course, the fate. Think I've got it, don't you know? Come on, chaps. Let's go. Off they went. Her ladyship with a tear in her eye, his lordship with a chip on his shoulder, which of course was really Timothy. Still the fate was a grand show, full of fun and games for all. There were swings and things and roundabouts, donkey rides and ice cream, balloons galore, tug of war and stalls selling simply everything. Homemade jams and cakes and bread and there were competitions too, for guessing the weight of Mrs Stout's quite enormous fruit cake, for growing the biggest vegetables, the biggest marrow, cauliflower, lettuce, cucumber, carrot and cabbage and, and... Yes, the biggest potato. What a whopper the winner was. By Jove, exclaimed his lordship. That'll do nicely. King Edward that, said Farmer Brown, the man who'd grown it. Bigger and ain't it. Too true, agreed his lordship. Here's twenty pounds. Don't bother to wrap it. But it wouldn't go in the car. It was far too big to go inside and far too big to go in the boot. Finally, after huffing and puffing, they heaved the great King Edward onto the roof of the car and tied it down firmly with rope. Guess what? That evening they had chips for dinner. Next day, chips for breakfast, lunch and tea, and again for dinner. The same again the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. Until at last they too turned into chips. Now, of course, it was all change. His lordship became his lord chip. Her ladyship, her lady chip. As for small fry, being young and still quite slight of height, they changed his name to small fry. Are we still important? said Arthur, asked her ladyship with some concern. No doubt about it, said his lordship. After all, we are now directly related to the great King Edward. Ain't the fellow, didn't we? And that makes us special? Chips off the old block, don't you know? Blue chip chips, me dear, and blue chip chips are cut above the rest. We're still VIPs then, asked lady chip, still not quite convinced. Well, there, replied his lordship. Except now, of course, instead of being very important people, we're very important potatoes. Her ladyship heaved a sigh of relief. Thank heaven, she said. I do so enjoy being a VIP. Even so, we can't stay here. The neighbours, they'll talk. Besides, you can't send a chip to school. Already thought of that, said his lordship. No, just a place. Corf Castle in Dorset. Here the castle's been empty for years. And that's where they went the very next day. Except, shock and horror, they found there's not much of the castle left. To tell the truth, it's a ruin. A magnificent ruin, mind standing up on a mighty hill overlooking the village and all but destroyed by the order of the parliament in 1646. Bless me, said his lordship. No wonder it's empty. It can't stay here. What now? asked her ladyship anxiously. We have to find somewhere. Across the village square, the sound of much laughter came drifting through the windows of a hotel, the bank's arms. Top hole, said his lordship. We'll stay the night there. The door was open. They crept through the bar. The landlord, Mr Figgins, a jolly man and jolly big, didn't see a thing, nor did his son Jeremy, who was also jolly and jolly big, nor his wife Frieda, who was busy drinking and getting jolly jolly too, not even Nick behind the bar. Very quietly they climbed the stairs, along a landing, up more stairs, then along another landing, right to the room at the end, number 10. Steady chaps, whispered his lordship, better see if the coast is clear. He squeezed under the door and was back in a jiffy. Empty, he said. Follow me. And very comfortable night they had too. What happened in the morning can only be described as fate. Small fry wanted to climb the castle. Up they went. 
over the ancient art stone bridge, through the outer gatehouse, up and up and up, and finally they made it right to the top. What a view! From where they were, they could see for miles and miles in all directions, all over the village below as well. Her ladyship used her special lorgnettes to see things even better. Suddenly she said, Come quickly, dearest. What's that down there? When his lordship had a look, his monocle popped right out of his eye. Don't believe it. Can't be. Looks like another castle. Down they went to investigate. This way, said his lordship, heading off down West Street. Then they were there. A large sign said, Model Village and Tea Room. Except it wasn't open yet. Two massive wooden gates barred their way. There was no way over the top, but there was a small gap at the bottom. Under they went. They found themselves in a large courtyard. They raced across the yard, through a little shop, past the courtyard tea room, under another door, and out through to two beautiful gardens. And there it was. They couldn't believe their eyes. There, on top of another hill, was another Corf castle. At the foot of the hill, another village, everything in miniature. Great Scott, shouted his lordship excitedly. It's a scale model. A scale what? said the ladyship, who never used long words. It's a model, my dear, a reconstruction. Magnificent what? So it was. There stood the castle, not a ruin either, but a Corfe castle just where it was when it was built. Intact, impregnable, in tough local stone. All the walls and battlements, the great arch bridge leading to the outer gatehouse, and under which the water of a mighty moat flowed around the castle, and in the castle grounds are stables, the dark and dingy dungeon tower, the high and mighty keep, the queen's tower, even the cannon rampart, complete with cannon too. Yes, it was all there, all in perfect detail, everything the way it was. His lordship's eyes sparkled. Well, my dear, what do you think? Oh, it's beautiful, so beautiful, said her lady Chip, quite carried away. Much more our size too. Can we move in right away? Hold your horses, old girl. Better make inquiries first. Let's hurry then. They left the way they'd come and dashed off to Fox and Sons, a local estate agent. A nice man they saw too. Actually, he said, models aren't quite the kind of property we handle. Real castles, yes. Models, no. I wouldn't let that stop you, though. Go on, said his lordship. Look at it this way, said the man. Only people as small as you could ever live there anyway. Besides, who will ever know? Dash it all, we'll do it then, said his lordship, jumping up and dashing out the door. And that's how his lordship, her lady Chip and Small Fry, came to live in the model castle in the beautiful village of Corf. The first night they hardly slept. They couldn't stop talking. I think I'll start a vegetable garden, said her lady Chip, full of plans. What will you do with your time, dearest? Always wanted to be an inventor, said her lordship, thoughtfully. What a good idea, dear. And what exactly will you invent? Things, don't you know, said his lordship. Things. And so he did. And Small Fry, he quickly gained in stature matured into a great young man and soon became a vital and indispensable member of the family. But all these things came later. After our family took up residence at the castle and fitted out every room with the very finest furniture. Chippendale, of course.